Hello, uh, my name is Dr. Jason Hickel, and uh, my presentation is titled uh, Ecological Breakdown and the Degrowth Imperative. So uh, just very briefly to set the stage, we've, um, we've been asked to reflect on the plausible reasons to believe that global environmental change could result in societal breakdown or collapse within the coming centuries uh, or a century. Now, first I should say that I'm not an expert in Earth Systems uh, research, but I do follow the field very closely. Uh, my expertise is in ecological economics. So what I'm going to do in this brief presentation is, uh, is number one, share some of the key recent findings um, from Earth Systems research related to the crisis of ecological breakdown. Um, and second, argue that this crisis is being caused uh, not by humanity as such, but rather by the growth imperatives of capitalism and by excess resource consumption, specifically by rich nations and rich individuals. And number three, uh, argue that any successful attempt to avert societal collapse will require what in ecological economics we refer to as, uh, as degrowth strategies. And then this can be accomplished while at the same time um, improving human welfare. So there's no, in fact, there's in fact no conflict between these two objectives. So first I want to start by drawing our attention to what is known as the planetary boundary framework, which I hope most of you are familiar with. Um, it's probably the most important single developments in global ecological science over the past few decades. Uh, the framework is designed to illustrate the extent of human induced ecological pressure. So in terms of geophysical processes like climate change, biosphere integrity, land system change, freshwater use, biogeochemical flows, and so on. And what it reveals is that for five of these key processes, we have overshot safe boundaries and have entered a zone of dangerous uncertainty uh, where we're effectively at risk of causing irreversible damage to the Earth system, to the stability of the Earth system. And we can see ecological breakdown playing out on, uh, on a number of different fronts. Uh, take soils, for instance, 40% um, of the planet's soils are now seriously degraded uh, mostly as a result of intensive agricultural farming, uh, industrial agricultural farming, sorry. Um, earthworm biomass on industrial farms has plunged more than 80% uh, compared to non-industrial farms or more organic methods. Uh, UN scientists warn that if these trends continue, uh, then we have about 60 years of harvests left in the world's topsoils. So the very soils that have formed the foundations uh, of human civilization for tens of thousands of years are suddenly in a matter of decades uh, on the verge of collapse. And something similar is happening in our oceans. 85% uh, of global fish stocks are now uh, recognized as depleted or facing collapse, mostly as a result of industrial trawling. Uh, some key species, uh, such as haddock, for example, have fallen to about 1% of their former volume. And, fish, and fish, uh, fish catches are beginning to decline around the world for the first time in recorded history. In the Asia Pacific, for instance, fishery yields are on track to hit zero by uh, roughly the middle of the, of the 21st century. So in the next 30 years. So um, marine species decline is also being driven by ocean ac acidification as the seas absorb uh, our excess carbon emissions. On our present trajectory, um, ocean pH will drop by about 0 0.4 by the end of the century. And this is significant because during the last mass extinction events that happened about 66 million years ago, a drop of only 0 0.25 wiped out 75% of marine species. Um, so this is uh, of significant concern. Then there are insects. Um, over the past few years, alarming data has emerged uh, from Europe showing that insect populations in places like Germany and France and Britain have collapsed by up to 75% in the past few decades. And this, this sounds dramatic, um, and it is, but it's also in line with the general trend in biodiversity um, decline. According to the UN Panel on Biodiversity, uh, research published or a meta-analysis published last year, the number of all birds, mammals, reptiles, and amphibians has dropped by more than half since 1970. And species loss is now happening at a rate of up to 1,000 times faster than before the Industrial Revolution. Um, now, climate change uh, is already having severe impact on human communities. And we, we see this in the media all around us, of course. Uh, droughts are ravaging much of the global south right now. In Somaliland, just to cite one example, 70% of livestock um, have recently been wiped out by drought. Uh, droughts in Central America, as we know, have been driving mass migration to the north. Um, in the Middle East and North Africa, uh, a number of armed conflicts have been attributed primarily to, uh, to climate change as a deep structural driver. And remember, it's important to keep in mind that all of this is happening at only one degree of global warming. Um, things, of course, are set to become much worse 
the commitments of the, of, uh, that nations have made to reduce emissions under the Paris Agreement so far are so inadequate that even uh, if all of them are upheld, and there's no guarantee of that, we're headed for more than three degrees of warming this century uh, within the lifetime of present generations. Okay. Now, what will this business as usual scenario look like? Well, between 30 and 50% of species could go extinct by the end of the century at this, um, at this rate. Uh, and for human communities, aside from displacement due to sea, uh, due to sea level rise, which I, I won't discuss now, um, probably the main concern has to do with food. Yields of staple crops are projected to decline by around 30% this century. The IPCC warns of what they call multi-breadbasket failure and, and I quote, sustained food disruptions globally, with famine striking a number of regions at once, making them very difficult or even impossible to manage. On top of this, large parts of the planet we know will become physically uninhabitable, displacing, um, according to recent research published and reported in the New York Times, um, up to 1.5 uh, billion people by 2070. So uh, that's a, a, a quite um, brief time period. To put this in perspective, right now there are around 65 million people displaced and it's already causing fascist movements to rise and international alliances to collapse and so on. Uh, multiply that by a factor of 20 and it's clear that climate change is likely to trigger unprecedented political instability. So we, we, um, we tend to refer to this as the Anthropocene, uh, an era where human impact is reshaping biophysical processes at a planetary level. Um, but the language of the Anthropocene actually has it wrong. Not all humans are equally responsible uh, for this crisis. It's not a crisis caused by humans as such. So take emissions, for instance. We know that 92% of total global emissions in excess of the planetary boundary, which is 350 parts per million concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere, um, have been caused by rich nations of the global north, mostly the USA, which is responsible for 40%, and the EU, which is responsible for about 29%. Okay? So the global south, which has the vast majority of the world's population, has contributed only 8% of, uh, of total excess emissions. So their responsibility for climate breakdown is very minimal. Something similar is true of resource use, which is a key proxy that we use for a wide range of ecological impacts. We know that a sustainable level of global resource use um, is around 50 billion tons per year. Um, we overshot that boundary in 1999, and today we consume around 100 billion tons per year. Uh, and nearly all of this overshoot of the safe boundary is due to excess resource consumption in high-income nations. Um, so most of the world consumes well under their fair share of the, of the safe threshold, whereas high-income nations consume on average about four times over it. Okay. So crucially, the consequences of climate change and excess resource use um, uh, both disproportionately affect the global south, the very regions that have done the very least to cause these problems. More than 90% of the costs of climate breakdown are borne by the south, and 98% of climate change-related deaths happen uh, among people in the south. Meanwhile, the majority of excess resources used in high-income nations, um, excess resource use you know, over the safe um, threshold, uh, are appropriated uh, from the south. Right? So for instance, deforestation in the Amazon and Indonesia is being driven by demand for things like beef and palm oil in richer nations. So it's important to recognize then that uh, this crisis has clear colonial dimensions to it. Now, ultimately, this crisis is being driven by our economic system, um, uh, which is capitalism. And um, let me sort of briefly explain what I mean by capitalism here. When people tend to think about capitalism, they typically think of things like markets, trades, businesses, and so on. Um, but this is actually not quite accurate. Uh, markets and trades we know have been around for thousands of years, and capitalism, by contrast, is only about 500 years old. So what makes capitalism distinctive is that it is organized around and dependent on uh, perpetual growth, by which we mean ever-increasing levels of extraction, production, and consumption. So it's the first and only economic system in all of human history that is intrinsically expansionary. If it doesn't grow, it collapses into crisis. Uh, so capitalism needs to grow by a, a rate of about 3% per year. And this might seem like a small increment on the face of it because we're used to thinking of growth in linear terms. But remember, this is a compounding exponential function. Uh, so 3% per year amounts to doubling the size of the global economy every 23 years or multiplying by a factor of 10 during a single human lifespan. This would not be a problem if GDP uh, was just plucked out of thin air but unfortunately it's not. It's crucial to recognize that growth is tightly coupled to energy and resource use. And this has been the case for the entire history of capitalism. 
for a while there was some hope that we might be able to dematerialize the economy through efficiency improvements leading to what we call green growth. But these hopes have been proven to be empirically baseless in the, uh, in the scientific literature. Um, in fact, efficiency improvements increase the level of output per unit of resources and energy, but they also lead to an overall increase in total energy and resource consumption. Okay. So what will it look like to arrest these trends in ecological breakdown if we can't rely on green growth hopes and so on? Um, let's start with the question of climate change. The IPCC indicates that in order to keep global temperatures under 1.5 degrees, global emissions must fall by half in 10 years and reach zero by the middle of the century. Now, remember, this is a global average target. Uh, and under the Paris Agreements, um, high income nations have a responsibility to reduce emissions much more quickly, uh, given their disproportionate contributions to historical uh, emissions. So scientists indicate this will require getting to zero no later than 2030. Okay, so zero by 2030. Um, the problem here is that it's not possible to accomplish this while pursuing economic growth at usual rates. Why is this? Uh, it's because more growth means more energy demands and more energy demands makes it um, all the more difficult and indeed impossible to achieve um, uh, this, this goal. IPCC models indicate that the only way to make it happen is for high income nations to significantly reduce energy demands. And the best way to reduce energy demand is to reduce resource use. Um, it takes an extraordinary amount of energy to extract and produce and transport all the material stuff that we consume every year. So doing less of that means using less energy and using less energy makes it easier to achieve a rapid transition to renewables, okay? Now in ecological economics, this is known as degrowth uh, and there's a significant literature on this now. Degrowth is basically a planned reduction um, or a planned downscaling of energy and resource use to bring the economy back into balance with the living world. Um, uh, rights um, in a safe, just, and equitable way. Now, the good news is that we know that we can accomplish this while at the same time improving human well-being and social indicators. Why is this? It's because past a certain, uh, a certain point, which rich nations have long since exceeded, uh, the relationship between GDP and human well-being completely breaks down, right? There's no empirical relationship anymore. Um, this should not be particularly surprising because after all, GDP was never designed to measure the well-being of humans. Uh, it was designed to measure the expansion of capitalism. Um, actual human well-being depends on access to the resources that humans require to live well, and this doesn't actually need um, much resources and energy at all. Uh, um, in fact, uh, findings in ecological economics recently demonstrate that high-income nations could provide for everyone's material needs um, with flourishing lives with about 80% less materials than, than we presently use. And a global model published this year shows that we could deliver flourishing lives for 10 billion people globally with universal education and healthcare for all with 40% less energy than we presently use globally. So these findings demonstrate that it's absolutely possible to bring the human economy back into balance with our planet's ecology and reverse ecological breakdown. Uh, but it requires fundamentally evolving beyond the growth imperatives of capitalism, uh, shifting from an economy that's based on extraction and expansion to an economy that's based on human needs and reciprocity with the living world. Uh, thank you. <laughs>